This is Lokir Felhart. I dominate here! He's a dark elf that has a unique fascination with looking like an idiot. But we'll forgive him for that, because we need him to help us harass marginalized groups, terrorize society, and recruit willing volunteers for ethically compliant labor. Okay, here we are in the lovely region of Cathay. It's a stunning area with many diverse groups. We have pirates, assassin rats, and worst of all, weeaboos. As for Lokir, I don't know much about him, so I'm just going to make some shit up. He's just some guy that was appointed commander of the Dark Elf Navy because he is the owner of the largest Funko Pop collection in the world. The face mask? Yes, he was in a horrible fire. A grease fire from when he tried to deep fry his Black Widow figurine. Anyway, now that we thoroughly understand our character's psychological profile, we can start playing the game. Just like any survival situation, we're going to start by cannibalizing the closest person to us. Usually, you can auto-resolve these battles, but I think that is a mistake, because this is an excellent opportunity to learn about the mechanics of my army. For example, now I understand that slicing a man's head off with a sword will result in his death. Ladies and gentlemen, the scientific method. As far as factions go, this one is fairly simple. We're elves, which means our primary mechanic is violence and human rights abuses. The only difference between us and normal elves is that we're honest enough to admit that. For example, if we kill enough people in battle, we can arouse the favor of certain death gods who will make our weapons glow, which is a universal sign that we are about to go sicko mode and kill everything. And of the people that somehow survive, we can take them as slaves and sacrifice them to dark gods for mediocre rewards. Now look, I don't endorse slavery, and I'm not trying to say it's a good thing, but <laughs> means of production, <laughs> predatory union policies with highly profitable. So, you know, think about it. Also, in Warhammer 3, they added in a mechanic where if you're building something, but you're also impatient, you can send in your slaves to help build the structure faster. Except they're not wearing any safety equipment, so they all die in the process. A tragedy, but also very convenient. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Back to business. Right now, our primary enemy is Zheng Shi. He's a pirate who is also Chinese, and I'll be honest, I find that to be deeply perturbing. Anyway, the game thinks we're going to lose this battle, but it's forgetting one important thing. I have a naval vessel nearby, and it's able to provide me fire support with three fancy abilities. So after grouping up a few zombie pirates, we can wipe the moat and gain a massive advantage. This is one of our main faction mechanics, so we'll be trying to engage in a lot of coastal fighting to abuse it to its maximal potential. Speaking of abuse, we positively decimated the undead all along the coastline, eventually culminating at Fu Chao, which was a siege battle that I took great pleasure in not having to fight manually. It's nice to have some territory, but now it's pretty much just us and a gang of Asian warlords who have a a less than positive opinion of me. Fortunately, I stumbled upon an old necromancer, and the game gave me a quest to perform a home invasion at his house in Shilong. Sorry, old fella, but 5,000 gold, 500 slaves, and some really nice weapons is definitely enough to override my moral compass. To celebrate my upcoming conquest of the elderly, I sacrificed 800 slaves to Cain to gain access to some helpful buffs. We now make 50% more money from each combat and take 25% more slaves, and I think that is pretty cool. Anyway, we invaded Shi Long, and the geriatric legions attempted to stop us, but we have a secret weapon, and it's called Discouragement. Our mage has an ability that reduces enemy leadership. Normally, this is somewhat inconvenient, but without leadership, the elderly will start to physically disintegrate, so this spell quickly becomes a soft nuke on any target I want. Anyway, turns out dematerializing your opponents is very effective, and we won the battle. Now with the red blades in my inventory, Lokir Felhart can punch people in the head really fucking hard. At this point, it's turned 17, we have a fair amount of money and a real-life Funko Pop collection of 2,266 people. Very cool. Unfortunately, the Burning Wind Nomads declared war on us, and so we're going to have to use our bolt throwers to politely negotiate the terms of their surrender. That was going pretty well for us, and we even unlocked some exciting new units, so I got a little cocky and declared war on the Jade Custodians as well. I defeated them at the Battle of Nanchang, which was when I realized the true and most divine game mechanic of my faction, which is simply stealing other people people shit. Rather than settling Nanchang, we can sack it for 10,000 gold. This is pretty good, but after doing a little math, I realized I could invest in specific talents and perform certain ritual sacrifices that would increase my sacking efficiency by 210%. So this $10,000 can quickly become 30,000 if I set everything up just right. It was at this point I realized my purpose in life was not to control an empire, but rather to make a shitload of money by destroying everyone else's. This was going really well, and I was using the riverways to bounce around the 
province, raiding settlements and running off with their money. I would then take this money and invest it into my Black Ark, which is basically a floating city with guns. Truly, I was living the murder hobo lifestyle, and it was lovely. I even became friends with Snickich. This might not seem like a big deal, but if you've ever been sodomized by five Skaven ambushes in one turn, then you'll know it's better to be this man's friend than his enemy. I also started leveling up my second general. She's a dark magic witch who I wish had a slightly more pronounceable name, but that's not very important because she's really good at summoning tornadoes filled with knives and sheet metal, and I've been using that to absolutely decimate the lesser Cathayan factions. It wasn't all sunshine and roses though, because I got a little carried away with my military expansionism, and for a guy whose entire purpose in life is to have money, my economy is garbage. Also, Sinch decided to transform some of my soldiers into horribly mutated abominations. I'm not mad, I just wish he asked first, because I'm truly not sure how I'll explain this to their families. Finally, for the cherry on top, Zhao Ming declared war on me. Now, all of the other factions I fought were led by retired accountants and dementia patients, but Zhao Ming's primary trait is the ability to transform into a fucking dragon and kill you. Uh so his declaration of war was slightly concerning. Logistically, this war puts us in a difficult position, because we still have enemies to our south, and now they're also pushing from the west. The Iron Dragon decided to kick things off with an explosive battle at Shang Wu. Lokir's army was weakened, so I knew I was probably going to lose, but I was prepared to sacrifice every single person here in order to kill Zhao Ming. As it turns out, this was easier said than done, because our enemies have discovered gunpowder, and they're using it to fire rockets directly at our skulls. The invaders started by attacking attacking the left wall, and after a prolonged period of fighting, we managed to just barely break even. At which point, Zhao Ming brought in his second army on the right wall, and let's just say he absolutely crucified us. Lokir is usually a good duelist, but I've specialized him entirely into stealing money from innocent people, so he's a lot closer to some kind of IRS agent rather than an actual warrior. That being said, I took some weird satisfaction watching the Iron Dragon roundhouse kick him into a wall, but at the end of the day, it wasn't good, because we lost, and our main army is now dead. The dogpile continued with the Beastmen declaring war on us and sacking our settlements. If this was any other faction, I'd actually be frustrated, but the Beastmen are so tragically ineffective that it's just sad. Anyway, we're clearly going up against a real threat here in the western provinces, so I became a lot more liberal with my construction practices and started making use of my stockpile of volunteers. For the next several turns, Rirvato was in charge of defending the entirety of my kingdom, which was quite challenging because she lost her first fight horribly and almost died. However, learning nothing from my mistakes, I decided to immediately go for round two, and fortunately so, because it helped me realize something about fighting the Chinese. They might be the only faction that likes ranged units even more than me, which is annoying for obvious reasons, but we do have the tools to fight this. And by tools, I mean cavalry. If I wasn't such a hack, I would have already unlocked our raptor riders by this point, but we're not there yet, so I'm improvising. We have scourge runner chariots, which are skirmishing missile cavalry. That is a fancy way of saying they're a giant pain in the ass, specifically our enemy's ass. I pretty much just send them into the enemy backline and watch their archers have a nervous breakdown as they try to reorient their firing position 200 times a second while being perforated with arrows. And when the chariots run out of ammo, I can just commit vehicular homicide by putting them on melee mode and plowing them into crowds of helpless rice farmers. Anyway, through the use of dark magic and driving on the sidewalk, we managed to defend ourselves against the western provinces and drop them from strength rank 6 to 97. Which is great, but temper your expectations, because we are rank 98. Oh, and also, it's the end of the world, because a bunch of orcs showed up and they're doing orc things. However, much like global warming, this is a problem I have the convenience of temporarily ignoring. At least we survived long enough to bring Lokir back to life. And he's already dead. You know, some people might enjoy being anally probed by Chinese men, but me? I'm just not having a good time here. Take this battle for example. We were attacked by Zhao Ming, and through careful strategic maneuvering, we managed to kill all of his soldiers, and I still had like six units left over. However, Zhao Ming is a criminal psychopath, and he absorbed over 300 arrows without so much as flinching. Eventually, my chariots just had to take turns crashing into him, but he withstood that too and eventually chased down my general and beat him to death with his bare hands. I didn't realize I was playing a psychological horror game until just now. Anyway, after Zhao Ming was done giving me cavity trauma, I decided to regroup. Clearly, the only language these people understand is violence, so we need to speak it and louder. I tracked down Zhao Ming, who was still recovering from being hit by chariots 1700 times, and I took great satisfaction in 
auto-resolving him out of existence. Following this, I used Rear Vito to carve a warpath through his territory, capturing the Baleful Hills and Shang Wu. This was actually fairly easy, because Rear Vito has improved her magic quite a lot, and she now has access to this fantastic skill. She walks up to you, does some Naruto Hanjutsu, and then you feel an impending sense of doom, because sometime in the next 25 seconds, a gigantic meteor will fall directly on your skull, and you can't escape it. This is great for assassinating enemy leaders, and especially if they panic and run into a group of their friends. The culmination of all of these events was that Zhao Ming called me up and said he was really sorry and that he'd never beat me mercilessly again. And just to sweeten the deal, he threw in 5,000 gold, which I desperately needed. So I signed his peace treaty, a peace treaty that I would never ever betray, and especially not in the next three turns. Now if we want to exact our vengeance upon the gangs of violent salarymen that surround us, we're going to need to make some preparations. Luckily, the Chinese factions are busy pummeling Snicketch into the dirt, so that should give us some time. The first order of business is repairing our military. We have one army, and our legendary lord has spent more turns dead than alive, so let's fix that. Based on the geography of our empire, we'll need at least three fairly capable armies, one to defend the north, and two to be actively fighting throughout these riverways. I started off by upgrading Rear Vito with a name of power. It's a dark elf thing, but basically it gives her army a unique buff. So now all of our witch elves are cheaper, stronger, and they have a flat 10% damage resistance, which is really nice. Following this, I started recruiting some units for Lokir. His whole thing is these Black Ark Corsairs, and personally, I absolutely fucking hate them. I've never felt more routinely disappointed by a unit in my life, but they're very cheap, so I'm just going to suck it up. After completing our recruitment drive, we dispatched several rebels who were apparently dissatisfied with my particular brand of slavery, but that's nothing a little physical violence can't fix. Additionally, we're still at war with this Beyblade faction, but they're complete pushovers compared to the real Cathayan powers. And Nakai the Wanderer is actually rampaging through their territory and capturing their settlements, so that was fairly helpful. In their weakened state, the nomads wanted to end the war, but I'm finally in a position to finish them off, and so I just pretended to be illiterate whenever they would ask me to sign the peace treaty. So we pushed southward, taking the bamboo crossing in the process. We're only one turn away from from the nomad's capital city, and once we capture that, we'll have our back to a geographical wall, and we can push upward, annihilating all of Cathay in our path. Oh, never mind. They just confederated with the northern provinces, and suddenly Miao Ying looks like she wants to cave in my skull. How exciting. Well, this certainly changes things, because if I continue on my warpath to Fu Hung, it would mean war with the northern provinces, and they'd absolutely obliterate my northern settlements. So I sat, and I pondered on this dilemma. Hmm. After several seconds of thinking, I realized I'm far too deranged to let this interfere with my plans, so I continued my military operations. But first, I wanted to see if I could goad Miao Ying into attacking me, so then I could avoid the diplomatic debuff for declaring war. My annoyance tactics revolved around me raiding all of her territories to steal gold and slaves. Surprisingly, she didn't care that much, so after three turns I just attacked her outright. You may be wondering why I resorted to violence so quickly. Allow me to explain. Two turns ago, the game decided to make some kind of a cruel joke by giving me this quest. The only way I could complete it was to have an income of 6,000 gold. My current income? Negative 248. Yeah, if we don't start sacking settlements soon, we're going bankrupt and everyone is starving to death. So anyway, the war is on. Rovito started the siege at Fu Hung, but... I'm not liking our odds, and I don't think chariots can climb ladders, so I'll just try to starve them out over the next few turns. Meanwhile, I decided to sail Lokir up the river to begin pillaging enemy settlements. We performed a rite that increases our sacking efficiency by 50%, so hopefully we can claw our way out of abject poverty. Unfortunately, when we disembarked to raid our first settlement, we were ambushed by a man with a strange mustache and an even stranger mount. His name is On Lee, and from what I'm gathering here, he wants to headbutt me until we're both dead. So I obliged him and entered the battle. The fight started with a jade lion selflessly absorbing 800 arrows to the head. Still not sure what the tactic was there, but after that it quickly devolved into my spearmen chasing his archers around in a high stakes game of tag, and his swordsmen chasing after my chariots while gigantic arrows ripped them apart. Meanwhile, Lokir took a central position blobbing up as many enemies as possible and calling in artillery strikes on his own position. By using these novel techniques, it took us only 3 minutes 
to turn a valiant defeat into a very lovely and palatable Pyrrhic victory. Following this, we sacked the Celestial Monastery for 5,000 gold, which might not seem like a lot, but the turn prior we only had 400, so this is a major win for us. However, the northern provinces control a lot of territory, and so we're going to have to become much more aggressive if we want to really put a dent in their strength. Speaking of which, we were finally able to take Fu Hung at the low, low cost of several people I don't care about. Things are going alright, however the Chinese are quickly running out of people to kill. Snickich is long gone, Village has been beaten into submission, and Nakai the Wanderer has become some kind of eunuch, <laughs> leaving only us to absorb the full brunt of each haymaker coming out of Cathay. With the northern provinces directing most of their attention to the southern portion of the map, I tried to use my third army to apply some northward pressure. Unfortunately, the basic Cathayan garrison of peasants and dumpling salesmen was actually stronger than my entire army. Truly, this is a dark elf moment. So my army performed the walk of shame and ran off into the countryside as if they left their stove running. Our guerrilla warfare was working fairly well, until Lokir got caught out of position in a battle that was so laughably one-sided I just sat there and cried softly while the Chinese mocked me from their fancy weather balloons. This was a terrible development for us, so naturally I did what any rational human being would do and started making an army entirely out of Scourge Runner chariots. Unfortunately, it might be too little too late, because the northern provinces have been aggressively confederating with every Cathayan faction, and they're coalescing into some kind of super Asian. This might sound humorous, but it's not, because we've just lost four cities in one turn. For reference, I think I only had five cities total. So it's official, we might not be strong enough to beat the Chinese confederacy. Now I know you're thinking, but Reggie, you have an entire army of drunk drivers. How could you possibly be losing? Well, let me tell you this. In addition to rocket batteries, massive stone warriors, and enough archers to blot out the sun, Cathay has been employing gangs of carnivorous birdmen that stalk my units across the map and peck them to death. In addition to the obvious issue of being eaten alive by mutated freaks, they also have the terrifying trait, which means anyone watching this massacre gets fairly upset and considers leaving the battlefield immediately. With my army slaughtered, my empire in ruins, and my bank account fluctuating as wildly as the needle on a Dan Schneider polygraph test, it's clear that the end is nigh. But it's at this point I'd like to teach you a valuable maneuver I like to call shifting the goalposts of success. You see, we can never truly be defeated if we just continually change the parameters for victory. For example, the Chinese believe I want to conquer the world, but they're wrong. I've just spent the last 70 turns gaslighting them into that conclusion. In reality, I only want to conquer Hanyu Port. Why? Because it's the only place in the entire world that sells the Van Darkholm Funko Pop. All these battles, all the slave sacrifices, every single turn, it's all been about Han Yu Port. And now, it's wide open. At this stage in the game, we're confined exclusively to a few settlements in the south, but their infrastructure is so mangled that our GDP is effectively zero. That being said, we're able to field Rirvato's army exclusively by sacking enemy settlements. So I went on a warpath from the south, wrapping around the Temple of Elemental Winds and Kiang. We're heading straight for Han Yu Port. Members of the CCP heroically tried to stop us by charging headfirst into the Blade Hurricanes, but as you can imagine, that wasn't a particularly effective form of recourse on their part. Eventually, we made it to Han Yu Port, and I could practically taste the lead paint dripping off my ultimate prize. All that's standing between me and actualization is 3,000 members of the Ming Dynasty. Unfortunately, the auto-resolve isn't looking favorable, and even if you had a loaded shotgun in my mouth, you couldn't convince me to fight a siege battle with this many chariots. So we started starving them out, and on the next turn, the garrison came out after us. On our side, 1,000 Dark Elves stand ready to make the ultimate sacrifice. We have siege weapons, flying crossbowmen, and a squadron of women who escaped the sanitarium. On their side, disgusting abhumans, bovine artillery, and inedible canines. We had the high ground, so I decided to take up a defensive position atop this hill and trade artillery shots back and forth. As their infantry started climbing up toward us, I had my chariots split their forces on the left flank. The trick here isn't really to do a lot of damage, but rather to ruin their positioning while absorbing as little damage as possible. The Cathayan advance wasn't looking very promising. They charged uphill with Jade Lancers, and by the time they reached my spearmen, they looked like this. That was fun and all, but once the enemy archers got in range, things very quickly turned into a slugfest. Some of my archers had shields, which helped, but generally, we were pretty evenly matched. The only thing that was giving me the edge was that every so often I could use Rurvito to fly up 100 feet into the sky on a manticore and then nosedive directly into the enemy archers, resulting in their painful and near-immediate death. 
Apart from that, I just used her to abuse as much magic as possible. Fireballs? Easy. Giant clouds of asbestos? No problem. But most importantly, I cast this spell at least five times on the enemy leadership. As you may imagine, they did not enjoy that portion of the engagement. After 10 minutes, both armies looked like hammered dog shit. But fortunately, when the enemy morale is low, they don't cope very well with being chased down by blood-sucking harpies while dodging drunk drivers. And so they gave up pretty easily. The Battle of Hanyu Port was fine finally over. And just like that, our true purpose in life is complete. We have our prize, but what did we learn? First, Cathay should be considered an extinction level event and isolated in some kind of containment state like Ohio. Second, I probably should have helped Snickich every time he showed up at my door begging me with money and tears. And finally, I absolutely suck with Dark Elves. Oh hell yeah. That feels good on my balls. You better not clip anything that I say here, you little bastard.